Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Wind Power Engineering webinar titled Better Bearings for Wind Turbine Reliability. Uh, I'm your host, Paul Dvorak. Uh, I'm the editor of Wind Power Engineering, uh, and joining me are uh, Brad Baldwin from Timken Company and Cor Dudolf with uh, NTN USA. Uh, first, I'd like to tell you about our uh, speakers, and, and then I'll turn the microphone over to them. Uh, Brad Baldwin joined Timken in 1960, 1995 and is now responsible for new business development in Asia for the Timken company, working with OEMs in process industries and the wind energy segments as part of Timken's expanding presence in this fast-growing region, which includes India and China. Brad's developing a local, local infrastructure in Asia for long-term sustainable growth through innovation that creates a value to the customer base. Brad was named to that position in 2009 after holding a leadership position in Timken's needle uh, Needle Bearing Technology Center and managing the segment's global product management team. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M University. And our second speaker is Corey Dudolf. Uh, he's a senior application engineer for NTN Bearing Corporation and part of NTN's advanced uh, wind energy development group. Corey's been with NTN for 13 years, having started with NTN's test lab, where he specialized in failure analysis and product development. As NTN's lead wind energy engineer, uh, Corey is responsible for interfacing with turbine OEMs, managing aftermarket technical support, and coordinating NTN's wind energy R&D efforts in the North America and Japan. Uh, Corey obtained his MS, uh, his Bachelor of Science, uh, excuse me, his, Corey obtained his uh, BSME from the University of Wisconsin and resides in Chicago's North Shore with his wife and daughter. Uh, yeah, even though our, this presentation has been uh, pre-recorded, uh, you folks can see the, uh, the emails for uh, Brad and, and uh, Corey on screen there. And uh, uh, you can uh, email your questions right to them, even though we have a, a couple at the end here. OK, with that, let's start with uh, uh, Brad Ball. And Brad, uh, the microphone is yours. Brad will speak. And then if I hand it back to me, I'll say thank you, Brad. OK. Uh, and now I'd like to hand the microphone over to NTN's Corey Dudolf. Uh, let's see here. Corey, uh, the screen and the microphone are yours. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction. I would also like to thank everyone listening for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen to this presentation. For those of you unfamiliar with NTN, one quick slide showing an overview of our company. NTN USA corporate office features engineering, marketing, product sourcing, and customer support. Our location in Mount Prospect, Illinois is the main hub for all activity in the United States. NTN manufactures a number of bearing lines, many for the wind turbine industry. BCA was acquired in 1996 from Federal Mogul. The BCA bearing line includes ball bearings and specialized bearings for the agricultural market. NTN BCA products are produced in Macomb, Illinois. Bauer. NTN acquired ownership of Bauer from Federal Mogul in 1987. The Bauer bearing line includes cylindricals and tapered roller bearings, many of which can be used in the wind industry. NTN Bauer products are produced in Macomb, Illinois and Hamilton, Alabama. SNR. NTN acquired a 51% share of SNR in April 2008. SNR offers a full range of bearing technologies. NTN SNR products are produced in 21 locations worldwide, including one in the United States. As the wind turbine industry has matured over the last decade, bearing and gear reliability have become a point of emphasis. As early failures occurred, it was discovered that wind turbines offered a unique set of operating conditions that needed to be taken into account when designing a bearing for use in the application. As manufacturers accumulated more experience with their designs, it became evident that a more thorough analysis needed to be made of the application and the components being used. This presentation will cover the process NTN uses when designing a bearing for use in a new wind turbine, from the very basic life equation to the many factors that will influence that life. Once a prospective bearing is chosen for use in the application, the analysis begins by determining the basic bearing life. This step will give the designer a first look at how long the bearing will last in the application and the suitability of that choice. As you can see right here, we have the basic life equation of L10. 
Sorry about that. There we go. L10 equals 1 million over 60 times N times the factor C over P times E. Where N is the rotational speed of the shaft, C is the basic dynamic load rating, and P is the equivalent load. With E being the, a factor of 10 thirds for roller bearings and 3 for ball bearings. This equation is the basic life equation all bearing manufacturers use for determining bearing life. As you can see, the equation only takes in, as you can see, the only conditions taken into account by this equation are the speed of the shaft and the load applied to the bearing. The number provided by this equation gives the designer a good first look at whether the bearing will be able to meet the design goals. Many of the factors that we will be examining will work to reduce the bearing life. So a large value at this stage of the process is a necessity for ensuring that the selected bearing will work in the application. After the basic life is determined, the specific application that the bearing operates in, be it a main shaft or a gearbox, needs to be assessed. In this assessment, we ask how certain factors will change bearing life. Lubrication. Oil or grease will work to provide a thin film upon which the bearing components roll. This film prevents metal-to-metal -metal contact in the bearing. When considering the application conditions, we need to ask how suitable the provided film is and the effect on bearing life. Housing deflection. The industrial scale wind turbine transmits large forces through the various components. These forces can cause the components to deflect. In a bearing, this can cause a number of special load conditions, many of which will work to reduce bearing life. Misalignment. Every component has a tolerance. These tolerances can lead to slight offsets or misalignment in the shafts the bearings rest on. The effect this misalignment has on the bearing needs to be examined and quantified. Clearance or preload. After the bearing is mounted in the application, there will be a set amount of clearance left or preload applied. This value will determine how many rolling elements are under load and how that load is shared within the bearing. The first step taken to arrive at a life that accurately represents the reality the bearing will see is the advanced life that uses the A iso factor. One of the equations used is shown here. The numbers in this equation will change slightly depending upon the type of bearing used and the lubricant quantity. The numbers such as the 1.5859 and the 1.2348, those will change depending upon the application conditions. The advanced life takes into account three major factors, two of which are related to the lubricant used. The lubricant parameter, or kappa, takes into account how thick of a film the grease or oil will create given the load parameters. This val the value of kappa will determine the actual values of the numbers you see here. These numbers here. The EC number you see here is a factor that accounts for the amount of contamination in the lubricant. The more contamination that is found in the lubricant, the smaller this value becomes. Finally, there is the fatigue factor that takes into account how heavily loaded the bearing is. And that fatigue factor is the CU over P ratio. CU is the fatigue load limit of the bearing. The CU factor is a fraction of the static capacity of the bearing. CU over P ratio takes into account how heavily or lightly stressed the bearing is. In a lightly stressed bearing, this factor will work to enhance the calculated bearing life. In a heavily loaded bearing, it will work to degrade the calculated life. Housing deflection in the wind turbine creates a number of issues that the designer must grapple with. The deflection can occur in a number of directions and can vary for different areas of the housing. To address these multitude of factors, designers use advanced software programs that can calculate the amount of deflection involved and how that impacts bearing life. These software programs allow for 3D modeling of gearboxes or shafts, which allow a designer to visually see the amount of deflection and better understand what is going on in the application. Because of the computational power brought to bear by these programs, updated stress methods can be used for analyzing the application. These software packages allow for multiple shafts bearings to be modeled at one time. 
This allows for a designer to take into account the effects that other components in the system may have on the deflection of the bearing being analyzed. Cylindrical roller bearings are produced with a set amount of clearance or space inside of the bearing. When mounting the bearing into the application, a certain amount of this clearance is removed. While tapered roller bearings do not have a manufactured clearance, a set amount of clearance or preload will be designed into the system for the bearing to operate under. By knowing the amount of clearance left in the cylindrical roller bearing, or the preload in the tapered roller bearing, it is possible to determine the number of rollers carrying the load in the application. The greater the number of rollers carrying the load, the lower the stress in the bearing. This information can then be used to modify the calculated bearing life to more accurately represent reality. One way to represent this, the effect this has is to display the amount of load carried by each roller on the bearing. If you look at the top plot here, you can see going around the bearing the, the load on each individual roller as you're moving around. The greater the number of rollers that carry the load, the lower the overall stress in the bearing and the longer the life. A second way of showcasing this is the life versus preload setting chart, which is the second or bottom chart here. This chart gives the, gives the correlation between life and setting in a tapered roller bearing. As tapered roller bearings begin to move to low clearance and on into preload, life in effect will increase up to a certain point at which life begins to drop. It's the job of the designer to take into account what this range is and to, apply, and to provide it to the manufacturer. Now that all of our analysis is complete, the results can be reviewed and the questions asked. The first question to be asked is, does a certain factor enhance or limit the bearing's life? If the factor is limiting bearing life, common for deflections and misalignments, is there some change that can be made in the design or in the bearing to eliminate this limitation? If the factor is enhancing bearing life, common under good lubrication, is there a change that can be made to improve this enhancement even more? Once the fully adjusted life has arrived at, it can be compared to the user's life goal. Should the bearing meet the life goal, no changes are needed. Should the fully adjusted life fail to meet, meet the user's life goal, a number of changes to the bearing can be explored. Special steels can be used that offer an increase in life when compared with standard materials. A change can be made to the heat treatment process for longer life under the given operating conditions. If none of these work, the ability of the application to accept a larger bearing can be explored in conjunction with the user. This is really only an option at the initial design stage of the wind turbine. After the bearing life is calculated and system deflections become known, NTN will review the roller stress upon the bearing. It is possible for a bearing to meet the life requirements but still operate under a high stress condition that could limit bearing life. One possible problem is that the stress on the highest loaded roller may exceed certain limits and will need to be addressed. Under significant deflections and or misalignment, it is possible to have high edge stresses where the end of the roller digs into the raceway. If the bearing should have either of these problems, changes to the internal design can be made. Crowning of the rolling elements or raceways can be changed to reduce these effects and eliminate stress-based failures. Due to the enhanced needs of the wind power industry, MTN has added additional checks to the production process for all bearings destined for wind turbine use. This is known to MTN as the S30 system. These checks are designed to produce a quality product and to meet the user's needs for critical quality inf information. Each bearing is given an individual serial number so that critical quality information can be traced back to when the part was produced. Due to the importance of the application, the critical dimensions on each bearing produced are measured. This is in addition to the normal QA checks performed on bearings produced by NTN. These measurements are kept on file and can be provided to the customer at their, at their request. This is becoming more common in the industry as a standard. While we have discussed a number of different ways that bearing life and load can be analyzed, a valid question would be how does this actually improve bearing reliability? By coming to a thorough understanding of the application, we can appreciate the forces that are acting on the bearing. 
If there are significant deflections in the application, they can be identified early on, and an appropriate bearing can be selected for handling the deflection or for supporting the larger loads. If needed, special crowning and materials can be used to mitigate some of the problems identified in the analysis. In short, by identifying potential problems early in the design stage, steps can be made to avoid failures before they can occur in the application. Thank you very much, and back to you, Paul. Before we wrap up, let me ask these guys a couple questions. Uh, uh, Corey, uh, here's one for you. Um, of all the factors you listed, what do you think is the most important in terms of bearing life? Well, Paul, I think, I think the biggest, most important factor would be the capacity of the bearing. Everything pretty much stops and starts there. If, if the bearing doesn't have the capacity early on in the design, there's only so much special steels and special designs can do. After okay. that, how big of a load is being applied, and then in decreasing importance, misalignment and lubrication. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I have a couple questions for Brad now. Um, Brad, uh, uh, can a bearing manufacturer influence the design of a turbine? And if so, how? Okay. And uh, what are the biggest issues you see in uh, bearing design and related performance? Okay, very good. Uh, I want to thank you, gentlemen, again, for your presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, our listening audience, that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, if you have questions for these guys uh, on the first, uh, second slides of uh, the presentation, you'll find their email addresses. Uh, I wish everybody a good afternoon. Are you okay? Lance, are you there? Yeah, I'm I here. Say, yeah, I was there at the... Okay, you can, uh, you can. Hey, quick question. Can, uh, this is Corey from NTN. Yeah. yeah. Um, mainly for Lance. Yeah. About the third slide I did, I had something go wrong when I touched the computer, and it kind of jumped a couple of slides. Do you think you might be able to edit that out? Um, I believe so. Uh, 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 Dave, is our, uh, Dave and Taylor are edit, edit, like video editing guys. And so I would assume you have the capabilities, but uh, I'm not exactly sure. If you could, it would be I'm going to say I think they not. can. I've seen what they I've seen what they've done with the, my presentations before. So they they uh, they're usually pretty good at this. In fact, this is like video. This is not just audio. Okay. So I tell you, Corey, if you send the correct slide, this the slide you really want to present, it, send that to. Uh, uh, no, it, it, the slides were Lance. correct. It's just I happened to have hit something on the mouse pad that advanced the slide. Okay. And we oh, bounced around like three slides until I found what I wanted. Okay, it was. Uh, you know, I, I know you said oops. I know you said oops. I don't think I don't think it it updated quickly enough to to, to notice anything. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, Taylor to take a look at that. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, and and this will look a lot different on screen when you see it edited than than what you may think it will appear. Okay, so. Um, all right, uh, Corey. Thank you very much for your persistence. I appreciate that. No problem. Okay. All right, you're free to go. You know that. All right, it's Brad we have to deal with now. Okay. All right, thank you very much, guys. Uh, okay. Lance, is there anything else we can do can for you, the time being? Can you guys hear me now? Hey, Brad, I can hear you now. Good. Oh, okay, Brad, you're back on. Okay. Good. Let's yeah. Can you? You can hear me okay. I can yeah, hear you, yeah. I, I, you're using your computer right now, correct? That's correct. Okay. Were you able to do, were you able to sign in via the telephone? Um, I did not try yet. You, you know what's, what's happened is, is my company puts um, security screens, and for whatever reason, they will not let me go out to go to meeting. And uh, so I've logged on on my home computer now and tried to transfer my files over, and that's how I've been able to get on. But there's a, there must be a um, a proxy setting that they blocked GoToMeeting for whatever reason. Huh. So I, that's the only thing I can think of um, is the reason why I was having problems. Okay. But, um, but anyhow, uh, my hope here is that I can... Uh, uh, bring up my stuff here, and we can get going. Okay.
Okay. You apparently you've got control of the screen. I can see your screen. I can see your. Oh, you uh, can. Okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I right clicked Brad's name and made him a, made him the presenter. Okay. Okay. See his screen. Okay, just just for ease sake, uh, well, why don't you go ahead and try uh, calling in uh, with the phone to do that okay. audio? And do you see under the audio tab, there's an audio mode. It says use telephone or use mic and speakers. Yeah, yeah, I see yeah. that. You'll want to click the uh, click the use telephone, and I think it'll give you a number for you to call. That's something I, I, I learned, Paul. Uh, he had, yes. Brad had signed in as an attendee, and so I went to that attendee uh -huh. list, and if you right-click on their name, uh, you can make them presenter, make panelist, make organizer, so they don't have to sign back out and sign back in. Uh, so I learned that as we were doing it. Well, we have both learned a lot today, haven't we? That's true. <laughs> okay, Brad, are you there? Oh. Okay, are you there, Brad? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Yes, I can. All okay. Right, so. uh, yeah. Go ahead and uh, go full screen with yours, and then uh, we'll do kind of a countdown, three, two, one, and then, uh, Paul, do you need to say anything before he, he starts? You know, I, I've, I've read your bio, Brad. Yes, uh, so I heard that. Insert your, uh, um, I will, I, I'll tell you, if, if you wish, since, since you'll have screen control, but we both have audio, we're both on audio, right? Yeah, we're both on audio. So I'll just give yeah. you, I'll give you a little, just a little intro. I'll, I'll, you know, I say with that, uh, let's start with Brad Baldwin. Brad, Brad, the microphone is yours. Yeah, hang on one and second. Then, uh, how's the, how's the uh, screen? Can you see it here? Yeah, we can. I see can see screen. you're making every selection. Yes. Full screen mode. How's yeah. that? Uh, <laughs> looks good. Okay. Okay, I see the agenda, right, Timken? Yeah. How about you the um. How about the slide conversion? I noticed Paul uh, was, uh, you know, letting it catch up. Was it uh, was it moving at a pretty good speed? I, I thought um, uh, Corey was pretty much on cue. He'd, he'd make a selection. Yeah, right. there was. It seemed like maybe a five second, five second delay. Very minimal, actually. Okay. All right. Well, so I would. I wouldn't concern you, but so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Just a. Um, Maybe just a slight pause after you pick the uh, the button. Uh, here, okay. The next slide button. All right. Okay. And um, so I'm. Uh, I'll start whenever you're ready. Yeah. I'll, I'll give us okay. a. I'll give us a quick give me, countdown. Uh, give me a little countdown there. Yeah. I'll give you a quick countdown. Then uh, it'll go to Paul, and then Paul will hand it over to Brad. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, three, two, one, and go, Paul. Okay. With that, let's start with Brad Baldwin. Uh, Brad, the microphone is yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting the Timken Company to present a few engineering concepts to improve both the reliability and performance of wind turbine systems. For uh, over 100 years, Timken has been a trusted supplier of highly engineered bearings, power transmission solutions, and high-quality alloy steels. Our customers around the world know that they can rely on us to deliver innovation um, products and services. Timken has been supplying bearings to the wind industry for 20 to 30 years, specializing in both land and offshore turbines. We provide technical expertise for the powertrain system, including bearings, lubrication, seals, service, and condition monitoring. No matter where in the world customers are located, they can trust Timken to provide the consistency and quality of our products and services. So let's take a look at the agenda. These uh, just wanted to cover a few topics today. Uh, we'll start with the, you know, the evolution of the turbine design. 
uh, and how it's going towards lower cost and improved reliability. And we'll talk a little bit about best practices to improve both the bearing reliability and long-term uh, sustainability of wind. And then lastly, we'll hit on the evolution of the powertrain bearing design and we'll cover the two areas of main shaft systems and main gearbox. While many new and novel concepts are under development, prime consideration is still given to four basic designs of horizontal axis wind turbines. The modular in the upper left, then next the direct drive, then you see the multiple generator, and last is the uh, hybrid. And uh, the goal here is to reduce the overall head mass, which in turn will lower the overall cost. The modular style is clearly represents the majority of today's installed base and has been updated to larger scale machines such as the Repower's 5 megawatt machine. Its drivetrain is comprised of main shaft bearing systems connected to a high speed gearbox that is coupled with a high speed generator. In case you're not familiar, you can see that the main mechanical components of a modular wind turbine, um, starting with the different bearings and gearboxes, Today, we'll focus on mainly the main bearing and the gearbox. The modular style of wind turbine is under scrutiny by the industry and receives some negative publicity because of problems, mostly bearing failures in the high-speed gearbox. The bearing failures observed are attributed to a number of causes, starting with improper bearing type, debris suspended in the lubricant, dynamic events, lack of standards and so forth. Despite these difficulties in the wind turbines and gearbox builders alike, continue on the path of scaling up the modular design using lessons learned and better technology to solve the problems of the past. The arguments in favor of modular construction include familiar, familiarity of the design and improved serviceability. Perhaps the turbine style which is gaining the fastest in popularity is the direct drive. The arguments in favor of the design include the elimination of the problematic gearbox and the reduction of parts by basically a factor of two, therefore improving the reliability. Popular turbines such as Goldwyn, Intercon, Northern Power, Siemens, and XMC have all introduced direct drive turbines. There is a big debate, though, on just how large a direct drive wind turbine should be scaled up to. The National Renewable Energy Labs in the United States, in their August 2003 report, that 4 megawatts seems to be a practical upper limit for a direct drive wind turbine when using a permanent magnet generator, primarily because of the top head mass and the cost. In China, where neonibium is in abundant, perhaps the observation made about cost is not relevant, but in other parts of the world, Cost will remain a factor, and that must be monitored. The direct drive technology will need to evolve in this style if it's feasible for larger offshore units. This leads us to the next configuration, which is a multiple generator uh, design. And to my knowledge, Clipper Wind is the, in the US is the only wind turbine builder pursuing such a design. Arguments in favor include use of smaller, lighter, less costly generators that can be operated together or individually depending on the wind resource at the time. Arguments against uh, still include having a high number of parts in the gear drive. Finally, we arrive to the hybrid wind turbine. Shown here is the Areva Multibrid. This turbine boasts a lower than normal top head mass compared with its power generation uh, capability. The principle of the hybrid is to simp simplify the medium speed gearbox to improve its reliability compared with a modular construction, and then to link it with a medium speed generator to reduce its cost compared with the larger direct drive generators. The same NREL report indicated that the large scale wind, this construction, shows some benefit. So from our perspective at Timken, we see this scenario beginning to take shape with a combination of modular and direct drives occupying space between 1 and 6 megawatts, while the hybrid designs are beginning to appear more in the 5 to 10 megawatts. So finally, we arrive at our discussion um, about bearings. And one thing you need to say is that whatever wind turbine design is chosen, it requires a high performance bearing. 
As you can see, there are many varieties of bearing types, and I will try to present an overview on issues and trends related to their application. For the sake of time, I will focus on main shaft and gearbox bearings, which I had mentioned earlier, since they are the most critical and stress bearing components. Today's modern bearing looks quite a bit different and uses various types of rolling elements to achieve different effects. Ball, cylindrical, spherical, tapered roller bearings are the most common forms and each serves a purpose depending on the application. Timken manufactures all of these types, so I would offer that our comments going forward about improving drivetrain reliability are somewhat transparent and based on what we believe are the best bearing solutions for your applications. To address reliability, it's essential that the design engineer accounts for the reasons why bearings might be experiencing difficulty. The classical failure modes are shown in this slide all apply to wind turbine drivetrain bearings. The inclusion mode shown in the upper left-hand box is related to classic fatigue, stress, and stress cycles and material cleanness. Geometric stress in the second box is related to the bearing ability to cope with high loads and misalignment. Point surface origin in the third box is related to the concentrated raceway damage caused by debris in the lubricant or handling damage. And the fourth is micropitting or frosting and is associated with asperity fatigue often observed in applications having thin film lubricants. As a fifth type of damage that is receiving much attention today is smearing. Smearing is not a failure mode in itself but leads to surface deterioration which concentrates raceway stress and leads to heavier spalling. It can be observed in bearings operating with radial clearance and a high roller sliding caused by loss of traction between rolling elements and raceway surfaces when rollers pass through the unloaded portion of the bearing. The smearing damage is attributed to local heat generation and adhesion and the contact noted at the orange star is as rollers are accelerated from a reduced rolling speed when re-entering the load zone. Looking at best practices for helping to improve bearing reliability, the first is actually to obtain accurate loading data from the equipment designer. Information received is usually in the form of thousands of sets of time series data containing rotor loads, moments, and torque that must be combined into manageable histograms for static analysis or weighted bearing life and examination of stresses under extreme load cases. This is only part of the picture, though, since the dynamics of a wind turbine are extreme. The dynamic events shown in the right-hand box reflects torsional fluctuation during generator engagement below synchronous speed, and such an event influences bearing raceway stress dramatically. This kind of input is normally missing during a bearing selection process, but needs to be accounted for going forward. Best practices number two is working with and, uh, and sourcing bearings from suppliers who understand their product performance. If one were to place the same bearing offered by 10 different vendors on a table and viewing, you'd not really observe a large visual difference. But the performance of these 10 offerings might be radically different in the application depending on the material cleanliness, the alloy method of heat treatment, consistency of the manufacturing, and many more factors. At Timken, we understand how bearings perform in an application. Our predictions are based on light testing as shown in the slide over 100,000 bearings and 25,000 different tests, and this knowledge is built around our bearing analysis tools. So best practices number three is selecting the bearing type best suited for the application. There are many aspects to this statement, but to simplify it in some way, if a bearing will be exposed to combined radial and thrust loading, select a bearing type such as a tapered roller bearing or an angular contact bearing that might, uh, that has been specifically designed to support such loads. If the bearing is only intended to support radial loading in the wind turbine, select a radial bearing that runs optimally under just radial load, such as the cylindrical roller bearing, spherical roller bearing, or deep groove ball bearing. All too often, though, these three bearing styles have been placed in positions of combined loading, and the net effect is always to generate extra surface tension on the raceway, raising its von Mises stress, making it more difficult for the bearing to achieve a 20 or 30 year life expectancy. We recommend just following a common sense or, or fundamental approach when selecting your bearing types. Best practices number four is to select a bearing which has sufficient bearing capacity 
which we call C, to support the load, which we call P. Although this sounds fairly basic, errors in bearing selection and method of bearing analysis have been made in the past that resulted in elevated bearing raceway stress levels and early failures in many vintage gearboxes. Standards including how to analyze the bearing and what stress levels are permissible have been put into place to guide our industry in helping to ensure better consistency in how bearings are sized to achieve required reliability. At Timken, we follow the use of standards, but also apply our own proprietary factor based on analysis tool called Cyber to guide us on a bearing selection. In an effort to reduce top head mice, head mass, we also find that structure supporting bearings can often be flexible and affect raceway stress. It is absolutely essential in making analysis of a wind turbine subsystem to apply advanced finite and element analysis to the process. We observe large dif differences among many of the turbine builders regarding required reliability analysis. Typical of the past, the bearing might have been selected to calculate 20-year life at 90% reliability, which equates to 175,000 hours calculated uh, as L10 there in orange. Depending on what capacity factor the designer wanted to assume, some designers reduced this number to as low as 110,000. Such small values create risk from a standpoint that the bearing has little or no reserve capacity to account for the unknowns. As more turbines are designed, uh, especially for offshore, we're seeing more conservative design life criteria for selection such as 30 years life at 90% reliability in green or as high as 30 years life at 99% reliability as you see in blue. The rationale for these higher requirements are based on the enormous cost of replacement should a bearing suffer damage. The final best practice five is to conduct a thorough FMEA. This is a critical step for evaluating beforehand the various failure modes of a bearing and the reasons they can happen by virtue of the bearing and system design and bearing and system manufacturing and corrective steps to reduce the probability of occurrence. Normally, the bearing supplier and the turbine builder work very close together on this effort. So let's take a look here at, um, at the main shaft in specific. Um, the rotor, the nose cone, and the main shafts all traditionally have been supported on the spherical roller bearings shown on the lower left and are still applied in many of the new designs. But with increased need for reliability, more turbine designers now are adapting various configurations of tapered roller and cylindrical roller bearings. So the most common main shaft support bearing is found in vintage turbines are either a three-point mount um, three-point mount spherical roller bearing or a four-point mount. Um, the explanation of that is, uh, is usually a single, single SRB or a double SRB. Both of these designs were engineered with the goal in mind to accommodate the high system deflections imposed during operation. Unfortunately, though, as time moves on and experience is gathered, it has become apparent that the spherical roller bearing suffers from unexpected failure modes which reduces the reliability. One such failure mode is prevalent in a spherical roller bearing is supporting the wind thrust. The wind thrust is normally high enough to force the two row bearing to operate on just one row and in such circumstance the contact patterns between the inner ring, the roller, and the roller and the outer ring are loaded become slightly offset creating a moment which attempts to skew the roller. The roller skew adds to the raceway surface tension which already exists in a spherical roller bearing because it must operate with a Heathcote slip, a term that refers to the fact that most of the contact points between the rollers and the raceways are rotating with some slippage because they operate with unequal surface velocities. Normally when the lubricant film is sufficient to maintain a reasonable separation between contact elements, a spherical roller bearing will work well enough, but in a wind turbine, conditions are not ideal. Uh, for the lubricants. The film generation often um, in the low speeds create very low lube film uh, thicknesses.
Turning to the direct drive main shaft position, some designs in the past have employed the use of a three-row cylindrical roller slewing ring bearing. While this design continues to be repeated, many of the new designs are working today are being equipped with a close coupled preloaded tapered roller bearing. Once again, this close coupled TDO style can support both combined radial and axial loading with true rolling motion to help minimize the risk of surface related damage and failure modes. Turning now to the gearbox, it is important to note that for the gearbox industry to survive in the wind industry, it is critical to make substantial improvements in applied bearing technology. Without robust gearbox designs, more builders will turn to the direct drive to gain reliability that is now being demanded by the customer. However, with attention to detail and application of proper technology, gearbox reliability can be accomplished. For example, Applying a TS tapered roller bearing at planetary positions instead of NCF cylindrical roller bearings, which, is, which have already been discussed. Another trend we see is, the, is for the removal of the spherical roller bearing from most gearbox designs, especially at the fixed positions that are required to support combined loading. At the planetary, gear positions, we observe again that the SRB is being removed, and two and four row cylindrical roller bearings are often applied. Attention must be given to load sharing across the four rows, and oftentimes the bearing supplier will furnish bearings with closely controlled clearance ranges to create a bias so that the load distribution may be better balanced. Some gearbox designers are now applying two rows of preloaded tapered roller bearings with outer races integrated with the gear as shown in the lower left-hand box. These designs are power dense and often create a lower stressed, more deterministic solution because of fewer bearing rows. The bearing selections in the back box at the low speed shaft, intermediate shaft, and the high speed shaft are also experiencing a change in preference. Common practice in the past has been to apply combinations of spherical roller bearings, cylindrical roller bearings, and ball bearings at locating and non-locating positions. Unfortunately, these combinations have proven problematic with balls supporting thrust loading galling at the high speed position, spherical roller bearings suffering from micro pitting leading to micro spalling, and cylindrical roller bearings suffering from smearing and micro pitting. Much has to do with the bearing type running with clearance and highly variable loading conditions, including very lightest ones experienced while generator is not engaged to the grid. Recently, the 2TSDM assembly is becoming the preferred solution at locating positions. This two-row tapered roller bearing supports thrust loading in two directions and gives special consideration in the selection of outer raceway angles to maximize the load zone in the unseated row. At floating positions, cylindrical roller bearings with black oxide coating on all raceway and rolling element surface are now being offered to protect the bearing from smearing damage. A significant amount of investigation is ongoing, though, to determine if black oxide is sufficient or if a better coating may be more beneficial in protecting the bearing over a 20 or 30 year life cycle. We will talk more about this on the next slide. Temkin has launched a new product called Wear Resistant Bearing, which takes advantage of our proprietary coating technology. Unlike the black oxide coating uh, product in which the coating is applied to races and rolling elements, the wear resistant bearing contains only coated rollers. Uh, black oxide is, is basically a sacrificial, and the wear resistant coating remains on the surface for the lifetime of the bearing not only protecting it from early smearing damage, but protecting it from later smearing damage, raceway denning, debris particles in the lubricant, and thin film lubrication conditions. In terms of mitigating failure modes, this coating is providing to be a highly effective in all of our testing. 
ES, or engineering surface treatments on wear-resistant bearings provide enhanced bearing performance by polishing the raceways, repairing raceway damages from debris, from, and uh, creating barriers to adhesive wear mechanisms and reducing shear stresses on raceway surfaces. This is a true resolution to many of the premature failure modes found in these back end of these gearboxes. So in conclusion, the industry is continuing to grow, not only in size and capacity, but also in knowledge. We have shown numerous solutions today for addressing reliability in the conventional turbines like modular or direct drive, which might account for most of the future, future turbines. Best practices will certainly help to minimize the operational downtime, and new technology will be needed to keep the wind energy competitive in the marketplace. Thank you for your interest, and thank you for um, your interest in the Timken Company. Um, I have a, just a couple questions for you, Brad. Uh, here's one. Uh, can a bearing manufacturer influence the design of a turbine, and if so, how? Well, thanks. That's, thanks. That's a good question. Bearing manufacturers are getting involved in really the very early stage of design. Turbines are not a, really a summary of many components, but a system that is interlinked. If it's a modular style, the main bearing operation is uh, directly related to the performance of the gearbox. In a direct drive system, the, the compliance matrix or the, the FEA analysis between the bearing and the supporting structure it's critical to ensure stiffness in the system for control of the performance of the permanent magnet generator. Lastly, uh, a bearing is only as good as the environment around it, which means Timken's also taken responsibility in many cases for seals, lubrication systems, and installation tools for, uh, for, for the, uh, the installation. And uh, lastly, I think the, the turbine is ultimately about the performance of the system and not really the design of the individual components. So, that's why we're very um, interested, and I think it's very necessary to get involved in the design, and, and especially early on. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Hey, here's another question for you, Brad. Uh, what's the biggest issue you see in bearing design and related performance? Well, I know we've uh, taken a uh, big wrap, but uh, you know, here's my answer to that. Standards and certifications are, are mainly based on certifying the bearing life around the load and fatigue of bearings. However, you know, most bearing failures are not from the overloading conditions, but from improper use of the bearings or lack of understanding of the system or lack of understanding of the tribological failures, such as the smearing and skidding and micropitting, which I discussed in the presentation. Unfortunately, though, most of the business decisions are made with a balance of cost and performance. So uh, we have solutions. Uh, the industry has solutions, and I've talked about one today is the wear-resistant bearing that can solve a lot of these issues. Also, I think the use of preloaded um, bearings, such as a tapered roller bearing over a bearing with internal clearance, uh, will also improve many of the system performance issues. So the key is at what cost will the industry use these advanced technologies to improve their uh, turbine performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, I see. All right, uh, good, and uh, thank you again, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our listening audience. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention, and uh, this will be available on uh, www.windpowerengineering.com slash webcasts, n slash. Okay. Uh, I wish all of you a good day.